They don't have people power. They have establishment power. Here's a question that somebody asked me the other day. When was the last time a sitting president was successfully primaried? Well, arguably it was 1968, when Lyndon Johnson dropped out of the nomination process and declined to seek re-election after the New Hampshire primary. I learned that a long time ago. I love electoral history. It's one of my favorite topics. I didn't know an important detail about this until I read the book Playing With Fire by Lawrence O'Donnell. I don't like O'Donnell's politics for the most part, but the man wrote a great book. So if you like electoral history, I suggest you check it out. What I learned, among other things, in this book is that Lyndon Johnson didn't actually lose in New Hampshire. A lot of people think he did, because it's usually characterized as a big upset and a failure for Johnson and an indictment of his presidency. But if you look at the numbers, Johnson got 50% of the vote compared to Eugene McCarthy's 42%. The thing is, as we learned in these most recent midterms, winning in politics has a lot to do with expectations. As a sitting president, this was a dismal showing. Johnson thought that the Vietnam War could be his biggest political liability. And given that Eugene McCarthy had positioned himself as an anti-war candidate, this seemed to validate those concerns. As Lawrence O'Donnell writes, All I remember from that night was hearing my older brothers yelling that McCarthy had won. I wasn't yet a newspaper reader, so I didn't see the next day's headlines, which were all variations on the New York Times headline, Senator Exceeds Top Primary Predictions in Peace Campaign. It was decades later that I learned LBJ had received more votes that night, 49% to McCarthy's 42%. That was the night that LBJ could finally see how completely upside down his world was. Everyone thought the guy who came in second won the New Hampshire primary. If image was becoming reality in Vietnam and in the presidential campaign, then LBJ was in worse trouble than he thought. In the way that mattered most, Gene McCarthy did win the New Hampshire primary. Because Jerry Studs and David Ho outsmarted the political machine in the way they'd filed their slate of possible delegates, when all the primary votes were counted, McCarthy won 20 delegates and LBJ won only four. McCarthy was officially ahead of the president in the earned delegate count for the convention in Chicago. The thing is, Johnson wasn't worried about losing the nomination to Eugene McCarthy. He was worried about losing to a candidate who hadn't even participated in the New Hampshire primary, much less announced when the people of New Hampshire voted, Bobby Kennedy. So Johnson pulled out way before he ever actually lost anything. Contrast this with a more modern primary, 2016. Most of the establishment press never saw Bernie Sanders as a credible threat to Hillary Clinton's campaign until he actually started winning contests. If you recall correctly, there was a lot of buzz about Joe Biden possibly entering the race. He was the sitting vice president at the time. Surely he would have been a credible contender. Biden decided not to run in 2016, of course, a decision he later came to regret. The weird thing is, Biden didn't have nearly as much time to decide as Bobby Kennedy. By January 2016, before the New Hampshire primary or even the Iowa caucuses, Biden had essentially no chance of getting the nomination. Why was it too late for him to get the nod before anyone even voted? Well, as Chris Saliza wrote in the Washington Post at the time, no votes have been cast in the 2016 race. That won't happen until February 1st when Iowa kicks off the process. But, and this is super important, the chance to get your candidate's name on the ballots has already passed in more than a third of all states. And that number will grow to more than half by the end of the month, according to Ballotpedia. Without your name on the ballot, you aren't eligible to win delegates. And winning delegates, as we learned in the extended 2008 primary fight between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, is the name of the game. According to calculations made by Elaine Kamark at Brookings, Biden has already sacrificed the chance at 1,000 possible delegates, and by the end of this month, we'll have missed out on 2,200. More than Clinton or Bernie Sanders will need to clinch the Democratic nod. How was it that in 2016, the sitting vice president was all but ineligible for the Democratic nomination before any votes were cast, but in 1968, the sitting president dropped out after underperforming in the first primary because he was worried about losing the nomination to a dude who hadn't even announced when the primary took place? It's because the Democratic Party has drastically changed the way it picks a nominee. 
and the Republican Party later followed suit. Specifically, both parties have democratized their process over the years. This is why I say Johnson was arguably the last president to be successfully primaried. No president has been successfully primaried since the process has been changed drastically. The thing that hasn't changed is that the name of the game has always been about getting more delegates. It's just that now, you need to get regular people with no real connection to the party structure to vote for you to get delegates. Sometimes, states even host open primaries, meaning you don't even need to be registered with the party to vote for who gets to be the party's nominee. If we look back at 1968, New Hampshire was the exception in not only appropriating delegates in some relation to the voting results, it was exceptional in having a primary contest at all. There were only 15 primaries in 1968. 14 states and Washington, D.C. The other 36 states chose their delegates at state conventions, with no input from the broader public, and those delegates would go to the national convention where they could essentially vote for whom they pleased. So who won the nomination in 1968? Well, maybe it would have been Bobby Kennedy, as he won four contests and 2.3 million votes. But sadly, he was assassinated after winning the California primary. It also wasn't Eugene McCarthy who won six contests and nearly three million votes. It obviously wasn't Lyndon Johnson, as he had dropped out. The guy who ended up winning was the sitting vice president, Hubert Humphrey, who not only didn't win a single primary contest, he didn't even bother to participate in any. Both Kennedy and McCarthy had hoped to win over the non-primary delegates to their cause during the convention. To this end, winning primary contests was much more of a selling point than anything. By winning contests, they could show non-primary delegates that they were appealing enough to win a general election. Kennedy's assassination created an incredibly contentious environment, in that there was no clear frontrunner for the nomination going into the convention. Despite having won the most primary votes and primary delegates, Eugene McCarthy, the anti-war candidate, never had enough supports with the non-primary delegates. This led to violent clashes between anti-war protesters and the Chicago Police Department outside of the convention center. On the convention's third day, it was Hubert Humphrey who won over the non-primary delegates and won the nomination handily. Again, if you want a breakdown of the granular details of what was happening day to day, I highly recommend Lawrence O'Donnell's book, Playing With Fire. He gives the inside story of the most contentious party convention in modern history. The violent outbreak may well have cost the Democrats the 1968 election which had been broadcast on national television. The Democrats reformed their process, democratizing it such that candidates actually had to win delegates over in primaries or caucuses prior to the convention. Republicans eventually followed suit. Ever since, neither major party has had a convention where they didn't know who their nominee would be going into the thing. In theory, it could happen if no candidate had won enough contests and hence enough delegates going into the first ballot. That's known as a brokered convention. After the first ballot, delegates are no longer bound to the candidate by primary or caucus results and are released to vote for whom they please. Again, one of these has yet to happen since the modern, more democratized systems were put in place. And just in case you were wondering, the Republican and Democratic parties are both entities that exist independent of the government so they can theoretically construct any system they want to to come up with their nominees. They're actually far more democratic in the nomination process than are the Libertarian or Green Party. Most people I run into in online politics don't seem to know the history of the nominating process. And while they could come up with any method for the nomination, the two major parties have felt the pressure over the years to bow more and more to public opinion. At the state level, fewer states are hosting caucuses, which almost always get less turnout in favor of primaries. The DNC has gotten rid of superdelegates on the first ballot, and the RNC has done away with unbound delegates. Regular people have more say in who gets a major party nomination than they've ever had. There's still one very important way in which the processes are highly undemocratic, though, and that's in the sequencing of primaries and caucuses. As I'm sure most of you do know, not all states vote at the same time. Iowa has been the first caucus for a very long time, and New Hampshire the first primary for even longer. In fact, it's actually in their state constitution that they have to be the first primary. This gives the people of these states disproportionate say in who gets to be the nominee. Bear in mind that most nomination contests aren't like Hillary Clinton versus Barack Obama in 2008, where every state gets a meaningful say. Usually, we all but know who each of the nominees will be after Super Tuesday, making the contests after that pretty much meaningless. 
The thing is, beginning the process with Iowa and New Hampshire is way more likely to help long-shot insurgent candidates. These types of candidates are way less likely to have the name recognition or resources that establishment favorites usually have. Hosting the first two contests in states that are small both in terms of population and geography, that have relatively inexpensive media markets, really levels the playing field between the little guys and the heavyweights, because fewer resources can go a longer way. Think about how Rick Santorum was able to win the most votes in Iowa in 2012, despite having almost no money, especially compared to Mitt Romney. Or think about how in 2016, when Bernie Sanders effectively tied in Iowa and won handily in New Hampshire, allowing him to mount a respectable campaign against the heir apparent with a famous last name. Except now, the Democrats are trying to change this. After the debacle that was the 2020 Iowa caucuses, the Democrats are looking at changing the sequence by putting the South Carolina primary first in the process. The online left is not very happy about this. The preemptive excuses are predictably coming out. Only reason to do this is to prop up Biden and prop up the establishment Democrats. It's so, it's so nakedly gross. It's so obvious what the play is here. And he feels weak. He feels like, you know, I am beatable. And so they're trying to stack the deck in their favor. That's exactly what's going on here. It's just blatant rigging. I mean, that's really no, what, there's really no other way to, to put it. Ultimately, they are setting up the states in exactly precisely the order and the pace that he thinks will be best for him personally. Yeah. And this is, this is what they have, man. The establishment Democrats have all the dirty tricks in the book. That's what they have. Because they know they don't have people power. They have establishment power. Ah, uh, yes, establishment power. When you get people to vote for your candidate. As opposed to people power, when people really vote for your candidate. Now, I don't think they're wrong when they say that the Democrats are doing this for the benefit of Joe Biden. Or a Joe Biden-like candidate, meaning a non-progressive. The Democratic Party has actually done something similar before. In 1980, the sitting Democratic president, Jimmy Carter, was anticipating a primary challenge and wanted to stack the deck in his favor. As Elaine Kamark writes in her book, Primary Politics, by the time Carter was preparing for his re-election campaign in 1980, he had resources far beyond his own powers of persuasion and his friendship with a fellow Southern governor to use in influencing the sequence of nomination contests. The power of the presidency could cause state legislators to pay serious attention to the wishes of White House political aides. The White House also controlled the Democratic National Committee and the DNC's Compliance Review Commission. The latter body approved state delegate selection plans and offered advice to state parties on how to comply with the latest series of delegate selection rules including newly adopted window rules, which named the second Tuesday in March as the start day of the primary season and the second Tuesday in June as its end. At the time that the initial planning for the president's renomination was going on, Carter was facing the possibility of a nomination challenge from Governor Jerry Brown of California. Three things were important to the Carter campaign as it looked toward renomination, and they all revolved around creating the best possible sequence. First, the season should begin no earlier than it had to in order to avoid providing a challenger with a chance to acquire an early win and resources with which to challenge the president. In other words, Carter did not want another upstart like he himself had been in 1976, coming out of nowhere and amassing the resources for a serious challenge. Second, numerous simultaneous contests should be held after the first two, making it difficult for a challenger with relatively limited resources to compete. Third, the early contests should be primarily in southern states, allowing Carter to build up a delegate lead early. Carter did get a primary challenger, not from Jerry Brown, but from Teddy Kennedy, and the president's strategy appeared to work as he won the nomination largely on the strength of his Southern support. So, Biden is almost certainly being opportunistic by moving South Carolina up to the front of the sequence. And progressives are correct to be concerned. The real reason why Bernie Sanders failed to get the nomination in 2016 and 2020 wasn't because the contest was rigged in any meaningful sense. It's because he failed to get sufficient support with black voters, especially in the South. The reason I can't abide by leftists complaining, though, is that by their own logic, this really shouldn't be a problem. These are the people who insist that they're the ones who are offering what people really want. Embracing populist, progressive ideas is the key to winning elections, according to them. At least, that's what they're always telling their audiences. Politics is an easy game that we make difficult. 
all those overpaid Democratic strategists in Washington, D.C., they're useless. So we have the answers. Now it's just time to implement them and fight for them and be unapologetic on that front. And if you do that, the Republicans will be in a permanent minority from now until the end of time. How can they make such sweeping universal statements about how progressive the country actually is, yet they're afraid that their undoing will be something as parochial as the politics of the Democratic primary voters in South Carolina? Also, these are the same people who correctly railed against establishment Democrats, telling them they were somehow obligated to vote for Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden in the general election. Hillary Clinton does not, you do not owe her your vote. The Democratic Party is not Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is not the Democratic Party. You are the Democratic Party. She does, you do not owe anybody your vote. She's got to come and earn your vote. They're right. It's up to the candidate to persuade people to vote for them. No one is owed your vote. How come the online left doesn't appreciate this when it comes to candidates they like, though? So, the first contest might be set in South Carolina. Nothing is set in stone as of the writing of this video. But let's say for the sake of argument that it will be. If there is a progressive candidate running in an open primary, or primary in Joe Biden, then it's up to them to persuade these people to vote for them. Why is it that only establishment candidates are held to the standard? On breaking points, they argued that the 2008 primary would have been drastically different had South Carolina gone first. The South Carolina primary, by and large, over time, has heavily favored establishment candidates. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's go to C3, and this is why it was important. Barack Obama actually trailed Hillary Clinton in South Carolina until he won the Iowa caucuses, meaning that a lot of voters there felt that they could not back Obama until he legitimized himself in another context. If the South Carolina primary had gone first in 2008, Hillary Clinton would clearly have been the nominee in 2008. It is blatant and always has much more of an establishment lean in the beginning, although they have changed their mind after results in Iowa and New Hampshire. So first of all, this goes to show that South Carolina voters can be persuaded to vote differently than they otherwise might have. Second of all, Crystal and Sagar's explanation doesn't even hold up. As they pointed out literally a couple minutes before this, Joe Biden lost the first three contests and still managed to win South Carolina by quite a bit. Joe Biden did horrifically in Iowa, did horrifically in New Hampshire. He did a little bit better in Nevada, and then he absolutely romps in South Carolina, and then he's off to the races for Super Tuesday. Maybe instead of crying about how it's rigged, they should try and figure out how to actually win these voters over. So South Carolina primary voters typically go with establishment candidates. Therefore, making it first in the process is rigging. It's just blatant rigging. I mean, that's really no, what, there's really no other way to, to put it, ultimately. They are setting up the states in exactly precisely the order and the pace that he thinks will be best for him personally. Yeah. But Iowa caucus goers typically go with movement candidates like Barack Obama or Ron Paul or Bernie Sanders. And like I said earlier, it also benefits candidates with fewer resources. You could be a candidate that didn't have a lot of money and didn't, you know, have a gigantic national profile to start with, and you could gain some ground just you shoe leather, you know, with your shoe le leather, like getting around the state and showing up at all the things and talking to the voters and like building a thing for yourself. How come it's not rigging the process in their favor when the Democrats start the process with the Iowa caucuses? It's not like there's some default way to sequence the states. Just because Iowa has traditionally been first doesn't mean that it has to stay that way or that it should stay that way. Every candidate seeking the Democratic nomination will know the sequence of states well in advance of actual voting. It's up to them to strategize accordingly. Why can't a progressive candidate persuade people to vote for them in this contest? This is a point Cenk Uger, to his credit, actually made when TYT covered the story. My message to progressives is this, is the same to, as, as to Republicans. Republicans go, oh my God, they're bringing in all these immigrants uh, so the Democrats can win. And I say to Republicans, well, then why don't you just win their votes? Right? Why are you assuming they're all going to vote for Democrats? Why don't you have policies that are better? Right? Now, I'll say the same thing to progressives. You know what? Figure it out. Figure it out. Get better. Okay? Get past the propaganda and win African American voters. And when you do, then you'll have the entire Democratic Party. Another reason I have absolutely no patience for their whining is that these are the same people who claim to be champions of democracy. They love democracy so much that they want to bring it to the workplace. 
The focus now is on the transformation of the workplace to make it a democratic place, one person, one vote where we all together decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the output. I personally think that democracy is overrated, but at least I'm honest. I've argued before that I don't think these people actually value democracy as a process. They retroactively judge the process based on the results they get. If they get the result they want, then it was a fair and democratic process. If they lose, then it wasn't real democracy. And someone somewhere must have cheated somehow in some way. And I think their gripes about moving the South Carolina primary up is pretty good evidence of this. Moving South Carolina to the first state is more democratic in every way. It's a larger state than Iowa, at 5.91 million people to 3.19 million people. South Carolina is much more diverse, and hence, much more representative of the country as a whole. Whereas Iowa is almost entirely white. It's not like either state looks very good for Democrats in the general election either. They were only two points apart in 2020. The only reason progressives oppose this is that they don't think it will help out a candidate of their liking. If the Democratic Party rearranged the sequence of states in such a way that benefited them, they'd be all for it. Don't worry though, I have a solution for the online left that will take away the DNC's ability to sequence states in such a way that gives them an advantage that will also maximally democratize the process. Instead of holding primaries a few at a time over the course of several months, why not just have every single state vote on the same day? A one-day, 50-state primary. We do it in the general election. Why not do it for the nomination? There's no need to mimic the electoral college, either. You can go by popular vote. Why should people in some states get more say than others? If you are a progressive, and you claim to love democracy, and you've managed to make it this far in this video, let me know what you think about a one-day, 50-state primary. If you don't like it, let me know why. I expect that some of you won't approve because you think it'll disadvantage insurgent candidates. And if you are against it on those grounds, that's fine. Just know that you're against the most democratic way to do this. And if you have to rely on a less democratic process to win, maybe progressive candidates just aren't as electable as you think they are. If you genuinely don't think a progressive can win in South Carolina, maybe progressives are just not that good at this. Thank <laughs> you.